A woman wants to find out about a paragliding course. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 676, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. OK, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here, clothes, uh, Wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long sleeve t-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. 
It also says we should bring a packed lunch. We do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. OK, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs> uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. OK, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams and I really do need to study. OK then, let's make it the one after the exams. Fine, we'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out some... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Starting at the beginning, you can see the on-off switch just beneath the two lights. Having turned the machine on, these lights now become very important. When the light on the left has gone out, you can begin making coffee, as it means the water is now hot enough. Next to that is the water level light. If this is illuminated, it means the machine does not have enough water. It is essential that you turn the machine off and add more water the moment this light comes on, otherwise you could damage the heating element. Once you have checked that both the heater light and the water level light are off, make sure the filter holder, that's the part with the handle just under the control panel, is in place. Once you have your cups ready, it is time to press the coffee delivery switch that's the button just above the filter holder beside the boiler meter. Remember to take a quick look at the meter as it tells you the exact temperature of the water. On both the left and right hand side of the machine, on the same level as the filter holder, you can see the steam pipes used for heating milk. These steam taps need to be cleaned regularly to avoid blocking. And finally, if you do spill any coffee, don't worry. Just make sure that the drainage pipe at the bottom of the machine is leading into a sink or a suitable waste container. As with the steam taps, the drainage pipe needs regular cleaning. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. First and most importantly, I'll tell you where you should go from tomorrow for your lectures and classes. 
The Health Sciences Building is on the west side of the campus, opposite the library, beside the History Department. As you are probably aware, there are six modules to the course, which will take a year to complete. That's two modules each term. In the first module of this term, you will be looking at current laws with regard to health and safety in the workplace. Don't forget that as you progress through the course, you should be building your thesis. This will need to be completed by the end of the year. Coursework will also be credited to your final grade, but the most important part of the course is the thesis. Now the final thing I want to tell you, and again you should know this, is that there will be a number of guest speakers throughout your course. They will come from a number of different medical backgrounds, but they will all be giving you their views on the relevance of health sciences in their occupations. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, and welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. What I'll be doing today is comparing forms of transport in different countries to see how forms of transport are affected by factors such as geographical landscape and economic development. My focus will be on countries in South America, Europe and Asia. The first country I'd like to look at is Colombia, which is in South America. This is a country where geography plays an important role. Due to the huge amount of mountains and forests in this country, travelling by air is crucial. I don't know if many of you realise this fact, but Colombia was the first country to establish a commercial airline, and in so doing they made aviation history. Today, there are more than 400 airports in Colombia for domestic flights, which highlights the point I made earlier that air travel is a vital means of transport in this country. Colombia also has a road network of about 48,000 kilometres, linking Colombia to Venezuela and Ecuador. Transport by road is important for trade as well as tourism. Apart from this, there is also a railway system, but it is in need of modernisation. The other means of transport is by steamers, with the Magdalena being the main waterway. Now let's turn to Colombia's neighbour, Venezuela. Once again, we see that internal flights are an important means of transport, as like Colombia, Venezuela has remote areas where flying is the easiest means of travelling from A to B. Trains are not popular, and most of the railway lines are in the highlands, as this is where the iron ore mines are. Trains are an efficient means of transporting the iron ore from the mines to the factories. Thus we can see how transport and the economy are interrelated. Ships are also used extensively in this country, and there are many ports, the main seaports being Puerto Cabello and Guanta. Turning now to Europe. Belgium is a country that boasts one of the most compact railway systems worldwide. Inland waterways, or canals, are also an important means of transport, transporting both freight and people. Belgium also has the third largest seaport in the world, namely Antwerpen. Air travel is also important, although this is not linked to geographical terrain, as is the case in the South American countries we've already looked at. Next, I'd like to look at the United Kingdom. Like Belgium, 
The UK has inland waterways around 4,000 kilometres, yet only about 17% of these are used for commercial transport. The main inland port is Manchester, and the chief seaport is London, with Southampton taking second place. Air travel is extensive in this country, and there are around 150 airports, the most famous being Heathrow. However, about 90% of passengers in the UK travel by road. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Finally, I'd like to look at two Asian countries. China is a country which reveals how geographical size affects transport development. Roads and railways are widely used, and this has led to a huge amount of bridges being built, such as the Yangtze Bridge, which is probably the most widely known. The Yangtze Bridge is 1.6 kilometres long and is built on two levels. The upper tier is for cars and pedestrians, while the lower is for trains. Railways are especially important, and over 80% of freight and passengers are transported by rail. With such a high proportion of people using trains, it is not surprising that governments in countries like China are prepared to invest in the railway system. Obviously, a fast and effective train service will encourage businesses and the general public to continue using it. The last country I'm going to mention is Japan, which has one of the most advanced transport systems in the world. The railway system is highly developed, and the Takedo Railway, connecting Tokyo and Osaka, has trains that can travel up to 250 kilometres per hour. Ships are also a vital means of transport in both international and domestic areas. To summarise, we can see that transport varies throughout the world, yet the importance of transport networks, be they air, sea, rail or road, cannot be underestimated. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on seasonal affective disorder. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the past few years, a new condition has been identified and given a name, SAD, short for Seasonal Affective Disorder. This is now recognised as a distinct kind of clinical depression, where people become depressed at the onset of winter, accompanied by a craving for sweet things, causing weight gain. Each spring and summer would then bring on almost maniacal highs and feelings of boundless energy and happiness. Experiments to combat this depression showed that increased exposure to bright light in humans could suppress their production of a darkness-related hormone called melatonin. The light needed to induce this change was about 2,000 lux, or about four times brighter than ordinary household lighting. It was then calculated that if bright light could suppress melatonin secretion, then it might have other effects on the brain, including the reversal of symptoms of depression. While melatonin's precise role in SAD has not been pinned down, the theory led to effective treatment. 
Not surprisingly, sad affects more people where winter nights are longer and days shorter. In the UK, an estimated half a million adults develop a full blown SAD in winter, and twice this number suffer the milder condition called sub syndromal SAD. About 80% of sufferers improve when given light therapy, and improvement usually comes within two to four days. Scientists are still unsure why winter depression happens. But more than a decade of research has turned up some surprising findings. Nearly 80% of sad victims are women. Researchers are uncertain why this is so. Sad can affect people at any age, but typically it begins around the age of 20 and becomes less common between 40 and 50. Sad is comparatively rare in children and adolescents, but so far researchers have been unable to come up. With a logical reason for this. As many as half of sad sufferers have at least one family member with depressive illness, suggesting that the depression has a genetic component. Some patients experience shifts in their body clocks when they're depressed in winter. They are morning people at one time of the year and become evening people at another. What is the underlying difference between sad sufferers and others? A clue can be found in carbohydrate craving, a common symptom. People often become obsessed with chocolate, for example. Carbohydrates alter brain chemistry by increasing the level of a soothing chemical called serotonin, a neurotransmitter that carries signals between brain cells. Sad sufferers crave carbohydrates because they may need serotonin to lift their mood. This craving can be intense, in fact, an addiction. It may be that the serotonin system of the brain has problems regulating itself during the winter. Some sad sufferers respond well to the drug Prozac, thought to influence the brain's serotonin using system. Other brain chemicals and hormones probably play a role in winter depression. Another neurotransmitter, dopamine, for example, may be inadequate in certain cases. Researchers hope to uncover clues to sad secret by probing similarities between sad and hibernation. Though no valid link between the two has been established, some sad patients say they feel like hibernating animals. Sad sufferers tend to put on fat in autumn and early winter, roughly the time when such hibernators as bears and squirrels do. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. To check your answers.